welcome to another episode of The Conversation. I'm Nubaretto. The Conversation, we have a chance to talk to different people in the community, and I'm really honored about today's guest. I mean, I'm amongst legends. We were talking before the show. I'm, like, I'm amongst legends right now, titans. I'm, I'm, I'm here with uh, Mr. Jones, Bob Jones, but I'm going to call you Mr. Jones out of respect. Um, first and foremost, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. I appreciate your thinking of me, first of all. So, um, you know, for... People who don't know, I mean, you, you're the former uh, superintendent of Broughton Public Schools, amongst other things, and you really climbed your way up. But I kind of want to just back it up and just kind of start from the beginning. Um, kinda, kinda, what brought you to Brockton? And, 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 and you've been here since. Let's, let's just back up and kind of talk about yourself and what brought you over here. My parents were born in North Carolina. And like the true migration, they went f at 18, I think, moved, they got married, moved to ba uh, Baltimore when one brother was born, then they moved to Malvern where I was born, then they moved to Boston where my sister and my brother were born. And we were there for about seven years, and my father got a job at Peter's Lunch, which used to be on School Street. Old timers might remember it, but he was a short order cook there. and. Uh, we moved on Pearl Harbor Day in an open truck. Uh, I was wearing a Macintosh and nearly froze to death, crying the whole way because I didn't want to leave Boston. Mm -hmm. And we got to Brockton. My father had a hard time getting an apartment. <clears throat> and finally he got one, and we settled in Brockton. That's where we started. Wow. I went to elementary school, Sprague School, then the Payne, then Brockton High. So talk about, um, so you're born, you're 90 years young, if I'm not mistaken, right? I will be. I'm 89. 89. I'll turn, turn 90 in August. Who's County? Well, who's County, right? <laughs> I am. <laughs> <laughs> Are you kidding me? But um, you, you kind of grew up during that, really that Great Depression era and coming back yes. and, you know, in, in, in World War II. Just kind of talk about going, growing up in that era and, and how was it different um, and maybe some of the struggles that you faced during, during that time period. Well, I had a wonderful experience at the Payne School. All the teachers are wonderful. We're talking now 43, 44, something like that. Right. Uh, and then when I got to the high school, of a class of 900, there were only three African Americans, myself, my good friend Harold Cornwall, and T.D. Simmons. And I was the only one in the college prep. Uh, and it was kind of difficult because there weren't that many African Americans, as I understood it, that were in the college course before me. And prejudice raised its head. I remember writing a paper for one of the English teachers, Miss Cosgrove, about uh, George Washington Carver and how much he had produced. I got a C on the paper, and I'm saying to myself, I thought it was a good. I talked about his accomplishments, his achievements. Mm -hmm. Didn't matter. And then she, another teacher asked, where are, you got, where are your kids going to school? So one by one, everybody stood up. And at that time, I stood up. I wanted to go to Universal Pennsylvania. And she said to the class, don't bother, you won't get in. I should have been crushed. Right. I said to myself, that's all I needed. Give me that little push. I didn't say I'll show you, but it was an incentive. Right. And uh, after that, I ended up going to Tufts. I was the only African-American in my class. Never saw a professor that was my color until I got to Northeastern. And I studied experimental psychology with Dr. Johnson. He was wonderful. The reason I'm mentioning this is because all along, if I ran into any obstacles, I said to myself, you either accept it, or you run through it, or you crawl over it, or go around it. But somehow, you've got to make sure that you do what you want to do on your own terms, and that's what I did. So you were uh, quite the athlete. I mean, so, so well, I, I had my day, but I want to remind people that I was only one person. That we worked as a team. Right. And that's when I learned, really, uh, the benefits of working together to achieve a goal, mm -hmm. even though I, I, I'll admit that I was quite, quite good in everything. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. I was quite good in most of what I did, uh, didn't have too much training. It was just natural ability. But we had one advantage, and I say we. We had a relay team. Uh, when I was 12, I ran on the uh, indoor track that they had at the current YMCA. And because of that experience, and then Brockton High, the old Winarnone School, also had a bank track. 
So when I got there, the high schoolers, my teammates, relay teammates, we trained on that banked track. And when we had a chance to go to Boston Garden and run, we had an advantage because they also had a banked track. Wow. And eventually our coach, Howie Sandrock, since we were the champs in uh, New England, took us to uh, Madison Square Garden in New York. The four of us set a record in the relay with uh, Dick Beals as a leadoff man, Gene Franciosi, second, I was the third anchor, third man, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. and Peter Sakanis. We set a record there in the Madison Square Garden that stayed for 25 years before wow. anybody broke it. That's how good we were as wow. a team. And I loved the relay because I was the third man. And Howie Sandrock, who came from the South, a little prejudicial, uh, didn't know, as far as I was concerned, didn't know much about uh, instruction and track. Mm -hmm. He still pushed us. And he made me run the hurdles, which I didn't want to do. And I became pretty good at it. So was there, was there um, I mean, it's of, was there like an Olympic trial that you guys tried to, to get into? Uh, not at, well, obviously not in high school. We were right. too young. But right. when I went to Tufts, uh -huh. the same thing happened. Were, our, we had a, a good relay team, but there were four of us. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, we had a good hurdler, Clay Williamson from Hanover, mm -hmm. Jack Gold, who was from uh, Brookline, uh, Andy Howitt, who lives in West, I think it's Westwood now. Mm. He was a hurdler and myself. And for four years, we were dominant in track in New England, not just in uh, Boston. Right. And we set records, and I've got pictures with us with you know, trophies and what have you. Um, I want, so, uh, so in high school, a, a, a lot of um, African Americans weren't going to higher education at the time. So you're, again, breaking another barrier. Just talk about that process of, of going from, from high school to college and, and really kind of being, again, the first. You say they didn't even have a, an African-American teacher in college, so you went to Northeastern. Just talk about that, that transition between high school and college. Well, on my mother's side, there were educators, and that's where the incentive came from. My grandmother was uh, a teacher in the South. Uh, two of her daughters became teachers in the South, and when I say that, uh, the training wasn't like it was here. We're talking now in the 30s. Uh, and that incentive was there. I have an uncle who went to AT&T. He was a teacher. And it was kind of drummed in us that education was the path to success. Yeah. My parents graduated uh, from high school uh, in the South, but where they were born, they didn't have a, 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 blacks were not allowed to go to high school. So the state paid for them to go, I don't know, 50 miles away to a, a private school that was run all by black professors Many of them came from the North with PhDs, so my parents got a good education in French and languages, science, etc. And so education was very important to all of us. Music was important. Mm. All four of us took music lessons, and I can remember during the Depression, my mother was paying a woman, I think it was 50 cents for an hour, to, to learn piano. And then we moved to Brockton, and they, somehow my father found an old piano somewhere and brought it home. It was I know it was out of tune because it used to kill me when my sister played it, <laughs> and I would cover my ears. But anyway, we all took lessons in music, and I have a great appreciation for music to this day. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so um, I want to talk about your college experience, and you said you had a great experience um, running track, but uh, academically, talk about your experiences there. Was, were, did you re face any struggles, again, being one of the few African Americans at college, at Tufts University, what are some struggles and what are some successes you, that you had over there? Uh, to say a struggle was an understatement. Uh, first of all, Dinger Dussault, I've got to mention him. He saw me run at uh, Yale, New England's in 1949, and I won a couple of events in the high school, in the high jump, and I think the uh, long jump. And he approached me, he said, Bob, he said, uh, have you applied to any colleges? I said, no. I said, I don't have any money. And, and so he said, Send an application to Tufts. I did. I got accepted. I had a dream of being a doctor or a dentist uh, because my parents were Seventh-day Adventists and part of that tradition was you uh, had to serve and help people. And my idea was to become a doctor. Well, I soon found out <laughs> that that wasn't going to work yeah. because I had to work. Uh, I got a scholarship my sophomore year, not the first year. 
because I had to prove myself. And uh, I had to work. I had to ride the train from Brockton to South Station to North Station, get a bus to get out. So two hours coming and going. Wow. And the train burnt coal. So I used to sit in the, in the front part of the train and the coal dust would fall on the books and I'd brush them away. That's how I studied. So the first year I took physics and advanced math, I wasn't ready. Uh, I was ready, but the point is, I was running track in the afternoon, labs were at three, we ran track until six. Mm -hmm. And then in order to uh, survive, I worked in a dormitory where they served food. And so that took care of my food. Right. My uh, underwear came from the athletic department, and that's how I survived. <laughs> yeah. So I stuck with it, taking very hard courses in labs until I realized uh, I wasn't going to make it as a doctor. Not because I didn't have the intellect. I had too many obstacles. So I switched to social studies. I mean, I'm sorry, social science. Mm. Sociology, I'm, I'm trying to get to the point. Right, right. And uh, that's how I got my degree. And when I graduated, I tried to get a job in Boston, telephone company, you name it. They weren't accepted. They said, oh, your resume looks pretty good because my grades at the end were excellent. Mm -hmm. And along the way, I got some good grades, some things, and not some others. And they said, we'll call you. Well, I'm still waiting, Ruby. I'm still <laughs> waiting. Where, where is that call? <laughs> my classmates, those who weren't going to uh, dental school or medical school, mm -hmm. of which many did, uh, they were getting jobs in Edison, uh, the telephone company, and I thought I could do the same thing. What's going to happen? So what did I do? I washed windows. That's how I survived oh. for the few years after I got out of town. So I used to carry a suit with me to work. I changed into a maintenance uniform, and the building is still there. It's called the Langham Hotel now. It was called the Battery March Building. And I used to put on a belt, not outside, but inside, and wash windows. And that's how I survived. Still going to BU to get a master's degree in, in uh, languages, which I loved. Mm -hmm. And uh, then after that, my father said, Bob, why don't you come home, come to Brockton, and see if you can get a job with the VA, and then you can continue your studies, which I did. Mm -hmm. And that, for two years, I worked at the VA in Brockton, which was new then. And that's how I got my master's degree. So what got you to... Uh to teaching. In what school did you start at first? Uh, it's a funny story. Uh, I was, had already moved to Brockton. I was mm. working the midnight shift, 12 to 8, and then I was going to Bridgewater to get my master's degree. And I was standing on the corner of Tamor, I'm um, sorry, uh, right near this building, mm. Pleasant and Main. Okay. Uh, no, Montello, I'm sorry. Mm. And I was standing there waiting for the light to change, and I heard somebody call out Reggie. So I turned around, and it was my old track, Dinga DeSalt. Reggie, how are you doing? Well, Reggie was another African-American in 1954. The oh, class wait, I'm like, wait, you're not Reggie. <laughs> <laughs> no, he didn't say that. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. But I, didn't, I respected him too much to say I'm not Reggie. Right, right, right. He said, Reggie, how are you? Uh, and I said, well, I said, I'm, I'm, going to ma I'm getting my master's degree, uh, or I want to go into teaching. And uh, he said, that's a good idea. Well, I got to tell you. About two weeks later, I got a letter from Dinga Dussault, and it said, Bob, have you ever thought about going into teaching? And I said, by God, he was the one who put it in my head, mm -hmm. you know, and that's how I started. Wow. North Junior High. And I remember walking in, and one of the administrators said to me, I hope you have a thick skin. I kind of wonder, what does he mean by that? Uh, I was the only African American in the school, and probably the only one in the system. And I had kids that came from South Boston and the really tough sections of Boston. They were moving out here for the houses that uh, were being built on, uh, on the east side. And they were tough. And I realized what he meant was, you're going to be running into some kids that are really going to challenge you. It didn't bother me. I'd worked at the VA with, with uh, soldiers that had been damaged, mm -hmm. PST, whatever they call it now in World War II, so I had seen everything. Right. And uh, it was a challenge, and I enjoyed it thoroughly. Do you, do you think you were, now what was the demographics in Brockton? Was it, was, it, was it more white when you were teaching, or what were, what were your students? Were they more black, or was there a mix? Uh, to be honest with you, I forget what the population did. I think it was probably 60,000. Mm -hmm. uh, if I'm not mistaken, probably about 2,000 were people of color. 
and many of them lived on the east side, not all, but many of them. And the Bakers and the Marrows and uh, others were the mainstay of the Brockton African American Society, if you want to put it that way. Wow. Wow. So wherever I traveled, I was a loner. I was the only one uh, teaching at uh, North Junior High and some of the toughest kids. And by the f uh, they gave me, at that time, Paul Ford was my principal. Mm -hmm. he, was, he was a lieutenant commander in the Second World War. He was tough, but he had a heart of gold. And uh, he recommended me to come to his school. Some of the other principals weren't quite so sure. Mm -hmm. And one of, I remember George Rahm was on the school board at the time. And when I got interviewed, he said, Bob, he said, if I gave you $100,000, for, for teachers, what would you do with it? My immediate answer was teacher training. I said, and I would take the teachers in the area for the kids that they're going to teach, let them walk in their shoes, I said, and then they'll understand the kids better. You're hired. And uh, so that's how I got hired. How'd you stay positive? You said, you know, you're always kind of a loner, you know, um, and you're teaching at a tough school. I mean, how'd you stay positive? What was your why? What kept you going to say, I'm gonna go back to work and I'm gonna try to get this I won't try to figure this out. My mother was my inspiration above all. Uh, I remember her telling me, she said, at nine, years, uh, nine months, she said, you were already walking and started to run. She said, you gave me a run for my money. <laughs> and she said, you never stopped. And uh, it's just a drive that I have in me. Uh, and I said, so obstacles prevented, uh, presented to me a challenge. Run through it, over it, get around it but do what you have to do to get the job done. And above all, you gotta know your people. So as a teacher, when these tough kids, they would give me a hard time. I remember, this is an anecdote, when I was working on my master's degree at Bridgewater State, mm -hmm. one teacher named Miss Halsman. She was tough, but she was an inspiration. And I remember her telling me, she said, Bob, when you teach, never turn your back on the kids, learn how to write over your shoulder. And I said, so what does she mean? Well, when I started teaching, the chalk would come, the erasers would come, throwing it at the teacher. But because I learned not to turn my back, I'd say, what'd you just throw? And the kids said, I didn't do anything. I said, yes, you did. Uh, usually what they would do was go to the office. Everybody was going to the office. I'm saying, if I spend my time sitting, I won't have anybody to teach right, because right. they were really challenging me. And so I said, uh, why don't you join the baseball team? You're so good. I said, you didn't hit me because I saw you. And then they would burst out laughing. That's how I tried to know my people, know my kids. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, that's, that's, that's inspiring. Just for me as a teacher, I know in, in our second part, I do want to talk about you going to administration and kind of the, the future of education now. Um, but I, I want to touch about just, just a little bit, you know, and how long were you, were you actually teaching for before you got into administration? Four years. Mm -hmm. The first year I had quote unquote, the lowest kids, the slowest kids. Uh, they were challenging me, seeing how I could handle it. By the time, at the end of the four years, I had the smartest kids, 12 of them. They, were, they really challenged me. Hmm. And out of that group, two of them, I remember Hal Boyle and a couple of others that went on to get their PhDs, PhDs in science, because that was my subject. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Jerry Long was a mentor. He taught me at North Junior High. He was my basketball coach. I could run, I could jump, but I couldn't shoot worth the beans. Yeah. So they always got me the ball because they knew I'd get down to the basket first, and then I'd grab it and look around and see who I could pass <laughs> yeah. it to. But he uh, became an uh, assistant superintendent, and Brockton High had been on the books since, oh, for eight years. They were trying to decide, do we put a high school on the east side, the west side? The west side people wanted on their side. Two high schools didn't make any sense. So Mr. Ford, who, um, sorry, um, Mr. Nelson, who was the superintendent at the time, mm -hmm. had the vision to hire a young superintendent to come to Brockton. And he was able, and I'm talking about Dr. Anthony Dan Tuano, uh, to build one high school, four junior highs merging into one at the high school. And that would do a number of things. It would bring the community together. The people on the west side who were mostly law lawyers, doctors, businessmen, quite frankly, didn't say it, very subtle, but they didn't want their kids involved with the kids on the west, on the east side, who were poor, African-American, and 
when the, after eight years, they finally decided to build one high school. And that was the beginning. Jerry Long, my mentor, said, I can't do this job by myself. I need somebody to help me. And uh, so they had a bidding process, teachers, mm. and I applied, and he chose me. And also, I think I had another mentor who was called, uh, um, I can't remember his name now, but he was the Tufts graduate. Okay. And he had heard about me, read about me, my athletic expo exploits. And that's how I started. And Jerry Long said to me, uh, Bob, he said, we've got a, a budget, I think he said, of $17 million or close to it. Uh, he said, we've got to get new, new furniture for this new high school. Well, some on the school committee said, what do you need new furniture for? We'll bring from the old on own. <laughs> and to myself, I'm, I'm laughing because the desks were bolted to the floor. <laughs> and I'm envisioning this modern 1970 high school with these old desks. And I just said to Jerry, imagine if you bought a brand new house and you bought furniture that your grandmother had. <laughs> he started to laugh. Uh, he said, okay, we're going to give you the school committee eventually I uh, said, we're going to give you $2.8 million to equip the school. Go to it. I had just come out of the classroom. What am I going to do? Again, it's an obstacle. I'd studied. I worked 18 hours a day. I was getting four hours sleep, mm. but I was determined. And I had to put out the bid, all the furniture. Uh, uh, Willie, who's in the background, will tell you that uh, I asked the students to test some of the, the, the furniture that they were going to use. And, uh, and they did, and I bought it. And I, if I'm not mistaken, some of the furniture is still there after 50 years. Wow. I, I believe. Maybe one or two pieces, but the rest have been, re I'm sorry, been replaced. You know, it's, um, it's funny how, like, history kind of repeats itself. Now we're in the looks of trying to build a new high school as well, you know. And so it's just crazy how it's been 50 years since, since uh, the high school's first built in terms of now everyone's talking about revenue. I'm renovating the high school. So here's what we're going to do. What we got for time left, Tim? 20, uh, 25 minutes, probably. Okay, so we're going to, let's, let's take a break. Okay. And then, uh, and then we'll talk about some, the future and how you, in your, your years as superintendent and, um, and, and kind of where you see Brockton going forward. I need to clarify one thing before we start. Mm -hmm. Finish, uh, not finish, but before we take a break. I was responsible for the monetary value of that school. In other words, I had to keep the books. $16.9 million is what that high school cost in 1970 dollars. $16.9 million. And every time the contractor sent in an invoice for his work, I had to review it and send it over to City Hall for them to review it before it got paid. And I had excellent assistance. We call them secretaries. I looked upon them as being assistants. Oh. And uh, they kept me on track. If we were a dime up, off on a bill, the, the uh, city auditor at the, at the time would send it back. And we'd have to, do, there were long sheets of paper in which every invoice was written in hand. And uh, boy, did that keep me on my, on my feet. Remember now, this high school may have cost $16.9 million, but we got reimbursed by the state as a result of it. You get reimbursed, was it 80% or what? Uh, I, I believe it might have been 90%. Wow. And I do remember uh, we had to file long after the high school was built. You have to keep a record of administrative, how much time did I spend? Uh, how much time did all of us spend administratively? And I remember we were able to get $100,000 back from the state years after the high school was built. And I remember the secretary, was. we were all excited because that money came into Brockton, which we needed. All right, listen, we're going to take a little break and, uh, and, and talk about your time as superintendent for the Brockton Public Schools. <laughs> and welcome back to part two of the conversation. Mr. Jones uh, really had a, had a great time in the first part, so we'll continue this conversation. We always have part three, four, and five. I mean, there's so much to talk about. Um, just a full disclosure for the viewers out there, we're both fully vaccinated, so if you wonder why we're not wearing masks, that's why we're both uh, fully vaccinated from the, from the coronavirus. So just just for the, for the viewers out there. Um, but Mr. Jones, I, I want you to talk about, before we get into the superintendent part, you know, you're one of the first black teachers in the school system. Yes. 
and and there were some obstacles that you had. And 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 one of the, one of the obstacles that we're talking about off air was that at the time you had a bachelor's degree, and you're still trying to get in. You were told you needed a what? Well, it was, a master's degree. Yes, yeah. I was. Yeah. Yes, it was. <clears throat> excuse me. The superintendent's office was in the Army Island School, which was the old Brockton High. Mm. And uh, like I said, I had got my master's degree from Bridgewater, but. Before that, when I graduated from Tufts, I applied to get a job teaching. Now, I had three years of pre-med and one year of sociology, so I thought I was pretty well qualified. And I remember walking into the school, and I met the superintendent, and uh, he said, well, you've got a bachelor's degree, which is good. He said, but in order to teach, you need a master's degree. And I said to myself, I remember one of my classmates from 49, several of them were already teaching. They didn't have a master's degree. I said, okay. So again, it was an incentive. I went and got the master's degree. When I came back, what were they going to say now? Right. I mean, I'm a Brockton High School graduate. I knew the kids. And uh, ironically, I saw my old track coach, Howie Sandrock. And he saw me in the building. He said to me, Bob, what are you doing here? I said, I'm applying for a teacher position. Well, don't. Uh, he said, what did he say? Don't tell him I sent you. I said, hmm. The old South raised his head again. Hmm. Another obstacle. Anyway, I got an interview by George Rom, <clears throat> Jimmy Jones, uh, Cortland Mathers, all businessmen or doctors and lawyers, and the interview went very well. And as I, remember, as I mentioned before, George Rahm said, you're hired. Well, he didn't say it for, he was saying it for the school camp. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how it started. So all along, there were it, uh, obstacles to me. It, it didn't stop me at all. So, you know, <laughs> again, like the, the same mentality, that, you know, that, that you had, no matter what it is, whether you're going to crawl, run, walk, you just got to make that progress and go forward. And I think constantly, all the time, you know, one thing I've learned the last, you know, hour or so is that, there's been some obstacles, and maybe that's something we got to take now in our generation. Is that there's going to be some obstacles, but you got to keep moving forward, and and, and I, that that's inspiring. I'm just letting you know I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. I'm a teacher right now, and without you know people like yourself, Mr. Wilson, um, that's I'm not even sure that that's the process of the road to get there is as smooth as um no as, but, as smooth as, as what I had right now. Yeah, it's it's never going to be smooth for right. us. Never, in my view. Yeah, but that gives us the strength to keep moving forward. Uh, you have a couple of choices. You could give up or you can just move forward. And uh, I remember my older brother who uh, went in the service. He went in uh, at the end, the tail end of uh, World War II. And he, his outfit was all African American. And it wasn't until General Eisenhower, I believe, who no, Truman, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. who uh, desegregated the armed forces. And I used to say to myself, how come we can go and get killed and give our lives in a Second World War and then come home and we got to ride in the back of the bus and you can't get a job? Now, I'm what, 12, 13, 14? My older brother never did like living in Brockton. And when he got out of the service, he moved to Philadelphia. Why? Because there were many, many more African Americans and there was a society there. And here, there really wasn't. Right. Uh, there were people who were born here, who had a, a great affection for Brockton, but it was small. Uh, he didn't like it. He went to Philadelphia. Then he said to me, Bob, why are you staying, staying in that small town? He always thought it was backwards. I said, because... I feel I have something to give back. I said, they educated me the best they could, and I got an excellent education at Brockton High. My sister came along behind me, Audrey, and we were talking to her the other day. She said, Bob, she said, I loved Brockton High. I said, well, maybe you loved it because I paved the way because <laughs> I said I had a hard time while I was there. I said, I had some great teachers, and I had some teachers that didn't think America, African Americans had the wherewithal to go much farther. Why don't you go in and be a carpenter, they would say. I don't want to be a carpenter. I don't know anything about it. I said, I want to be a doctor. And they would look at me with, uh, there's a look <laughs> that said, he's out of his mind. He'll never become a doctor. I came close, but no cigar. 
Right. But what a foundation it gave me. Well, I mean, you, came, you know, you didn't become a doctor, but you became, I'd, I'd argue, something just as influential, which is a superintendent. So I'm walking around. I was, I was in, um, I was, I was meeting with um, now Superintendent Mike Thomas. And I was in the, I was in the conference room. I just look at the pictures. I'm just kind of wandering around, look at the pictures, and I'm seeing, uh, and your picture pops out because I'm seeing someone that looks like me, you know, as a superintendent. It popped out. I immediately gravitated towards that picture, and then I saw your name there. And you're right, um, right after George Mathia, correct? No, no. Um... My memory escapes me. Okay. There were so many in, uh, superintendents after me. Right, right. They'd, well, in those days, a superintendent usually lasted two or three years. Right, right. Then they would have trouble with either the school committee, like I did, or the city <laughs> council, like I did, and then they move on. Right. Uh, but when, when you're a superintendent, uh, what was what was your main challenge? You know, and, and you know. At the time, even in Boston, you know, desegregation was an issue. What was your main challenge? What were the main goals that you had when you were when you were superintendent? I know this might sign, sound funny to people, but I always felt like I was the invisible man. I wanted I wanted to make sure I was visible, and I had to be because of my skin color, mm. uh, and I was a driving force. I wouldn't let anything stop me. And uh, <clears throat> when uh, and I'll have to thank the f a former mayor of Brockton, Wynn Farwell, because, <clears throat> because I was told that uh, I had already put, what, 37 years in? Uh, no, I'm sorry, 35 years in as an administrator, <clears throat> responsible for maintenance for all the schools, etc. And I had to come up against some tough school committee members whose ideas were still back in the 30s and the 40s. Mine was in the 70s, and in some cases the 90s. I'm thinking way ahead. And so it was a challenge when they would say, when it, uh, desegregation came up and the state said, if Brockton doesn't desegregate, meaning all the schools that have 50 or more, 50 or more African Americans of kids of color, that's considered a segregated school. And Brockton, you've got to desegregate your schools or we're going to take over. And if I'm not mistaken, there were at least five or seven schools in Brockton that had more than 50%. And where were they? The north end of the city and on the east side. So uh, the challenge was we have to desegregate. Well, Matt George had already been superintendent, and he was a good one for about 10 years. He was a people person. I had loved working for him, or with him, I should say, not for him. I always work with the people, not for them. Mm. And uh, he uh, stood behind me in most cases. Um, and he said, Bob, I've had enough. He said, I'm going to retire. I was 65. I said, I've had enough. I'm going to retire too. So we both put our retirement papers in. <laughs> and then one, Winfrey was the uh, mayor, and he didn't want the state to, to come in. Some school committee members, I think, did. And he, he called me one day and said, Bob, would you consider being uh, replacing Matt George? I said, when? I said, I've been in the system 35 years. I said, I've given everything to the system. I'm ready to go. He said, Bob, please, think it over. I said, OK, I'll give you that much win. And I did. I came back. I said to myself, it's another challenge. This is not going to be easy. Are you going to turn it down? OK, win. I'll take it. And I didn't know what I was getting in for, but boy, what a ride that was for a couple of years. <laughs> I'll tell you. Uh, there were members of the school committee, unlike the ones that had hired me, that had a different vision. And they had a nationwide search. $58,000, they hired somebody to find a superintendent. And when she sat before the school committee and she said, you guys are wasting your money. There's a superintendent right amongst your wits, your, your midst. His name is Bob Jones. He's sitting right over there. I could see eyeballs clicking <laughs> at the time, two or three of them. And eventually they agreed. And unfortunately, the mayor, when it came time to, for a contract, gave it to, uh, let me put it this way, it was difficulty. I didn't get a contract until I think I retired, believe it or not. The negotiation was going on. And I was so intent on getting this desegregation plan, 
I really didn't pay attention to myself because if I had been smart enough or thinking through, I would have hired an attorney to do my own negotiation, and I didn't. And uh, as a result, that was a difficult time for me. Not impossible, just a little bit difficult. Uh, and when the school committee, in the end, when they came out, let me back up a minute. Mm -hmm. The desegregation plan was such that the state was going to take over. When got me to work on it. I had a tremendous staff behind me, my secretaries, assistants, everybody pitched in. We had to put a, together a book on the desegregation plan. We had assistance from Harvard University, some guys that were really terrific. And to get the plan approved, we had to, I had to go before the State Board of Education. And the, the uh, chief executive, the, the call of the CEO, was Dr. John Silver of BU. And he was a tough cookie on everybody. <laughs> yeah. And I walked in there, I was by myself, I had the book. We also had one member of the State Board of Education who had come to Brockton and said, you don't need a desegregation plan. And I forget her name, she's passed on now, and had said that Brockton didn't need it. Uh, and she was on the State Board of Education. And I sat there for an hour and presented my case with a couple of uh, my team members that were behind me that really contributed a lot to the book. It just wasn't me. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, Dr. Silva said to me, Mr. Jones, that was one of the best presentations I've heard. Okay. Uh, sweat was running down my face. <laughs> and it's a, I didn't wipe any sweat off of me. I was yeah. trying to be cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, was, I was on my game, yeah, yeah. put it that way. Uh -huh. And uh, they approved it. Brockton got, uh, I think, 90% on everything after that. Wow. So the three schools, the Arnone, the Pluff, <coughs> excuse me, and the, uh, my man, um, Angelo, right? Angelo, yep. right. right. Mm -hmm. He was a tremendous, it was named after some good people, let me yeah. put it that way. Dr. No Arnone was another one who was in my corner, and he congratulated when I got hired. And uh, I had two of his sons as, as a tutor. Wonderful man. We really had some wonderful people. And then, midway, and I won't mention any names, somebody decided that instead of uh, the school board members being elected statewide, they would go by wards. And to me, that was one of the big mistakes, because now you had people who had an agenda, in my view. Mm. And that sometimes the agenda was not always in the best interest of Brockton. Uh, so there were another obstacles I had to run through, run around, uh, and it was tough. We had members of the school, uh, city council who also were tough. But in the end, they voted for the three schools, and I was delighted. But in the midst of it, I got a hernia. And I remember after a month, the doctor said, Bob, you can go back to work in a couple of weeks. And I said to myself, well, they're going to kill me if I go back. So I said, I'm going to take a month. And he said, put... He said, I don't want you going up the stairs. In the meantime, I bought a, a home in uh, Northeastern. Mm -hmm. It was built by a couple of lawyers who couldn't afford to finish it, so there were no lights and hope. And I saw an opportunity. Again, I'm thinking visionary. So I bought it in a, for a mod modest price. And then when I became superintendent, they said, you've got to live in Brockton. How come I have to live when the assistant superintendent, and when the city solicitor and others were living out of Brockton, but I had to move. Well, it's, in the, it's an ordinance. Okay. So I got an apartment in Brockton. Within a couple of weeks, I came home. The new furniture, now I had two homes, one in Easton and the apartment. Yeah. And I heard water running. I said, I don't, I don't remember leaving anything on. There was a couple above me that had two little boys and they were, what is the turnkey, I think is the name of the term. The parents were working. They were playing in the bathroom and they forgot to turn the water Oh, on. my God. So it dripped down on my bed, my bureau, and everything. I was furious. So on weekends, I'd go to Northeastern. And then on the radio station, they said, the superintendent doesn't live in Brockton. And they were giving me a hard time. And one of the reporters actually followed me home, if I'm not mistaken, wow. to see where I was living. And of course I had the apartment, but they also followed me home in Easton. And I think somebody might have reported, well he doesn't live in Brockton, he's going home to Easton during the week. 
And again, tight jaws, that's what I call it. My jaws would get tight, and I would say, they're only testing you. Keep on moving, keep yeah. on moving up. And that's what I did. Wow. Well, definitely, uh, you know, we could, we're certainly, certainly seeing the benefits today of all the work that you put into the school system. What are, what are, some, what are some advice? Let's, let's talk future. Um, what are some advice that, that you would give to, to teachers now, uh, particularly teachers of color, um, and even administrators? What's, what's, what's the main thing you should, you want a message you want to give to them? The teachers, in my view, probably are the most important in our society, along with firefighters and uh, policemen. But they're the ones who are training our citizens to be part of society. They are vastly underpaid. They are vastly under-respected, especially today. Uh, I can't tell you the number of times as a superintendent I would sit and listen to a parent whose kid had misbehaved and they uh, wanted the teacher fired or they felt that they, they, their kids weren't being treated properly. And I would counsel them and, and tell them, who was the teacher? What did the teacher say? What did the teacher do? I said, to, I said, put yourself in her place. I said, today, right now, I'm going to call the teacher in. I want her to take the day off and do whatever she wants to do. We'll pay her. I want you as a parent, go stand at Brockton High School in front of 25 or 30 kids in a classroom that was built for 20 and stay there for an hour and to come back and tell me how you feel at the end of the day. And their eyeballs would roll and they started to think, I'm going to face 18-year-old kids or 14-year-old kids. They knew they couldn't do it. So to teach us today, as I said before, know your kids. Get to know them. They're people. And I used to say to teachers, because I was responsible again, one of my jobs was to hire teachers for the New Brockton High School. I traveled to Virginia. I traveled to several states in the southern schools looking for African-American teachers. And I'd hire two or three, and they'd come two years, they're gone. And I would somehow track one of them down. I said, why, why didn't you stay in Brockton? They said, Bob, Brockton High, the teachers in there, they didn't, the white teachers didn't want us. They gave a hard time. And they said, furthermore, after work, they said, well, we, say if they went to school in Morgan State or uh, Virginia, um, uh, I forget the name of it, State, uh, Virginia State. Mm. They had a society there. We would get together and have a drink and we would, you know, relieve our, uh, relive, I'm sorry, here, who do we go out with? We never got invited to any homes of our teachers. In the break room, they used to talk about kids as if they were dirt. They didn't like it. Right. It was hard to keep teachers here. I don't know if things you, have you, changed today. Sometimes you run into teachers who don't like kids. That's my point. <laughs> uh, every school year, at the beginning right. of the school year when I was superintendent, I would say to the 1,800 teachers that we had, before you do anything else, Here's what I ask you. Not, it's not a favor. I'm not telling you. Every student that you have, treat them as if your own child. And the place would get silent. And I said, furthermore, when I go through the schools, I don't want to hear any raised voices. I said, I've been in some place and I heard them shouting at kids, and I've seen some principals actually poking kids in the chest. Do you do that to your own kids? If you do, you shouldn't be a parent and you shouldn't be a teacher. Yeah. Wow. I think um, it's, just, it's just fascinating because now I'm, you know, I'm just looking now as myself as a teacher. Um, I'm blessed because a lot of things have changed. A lot of things have changed. Um, a, lot, a lot of people want to go into teaching. The diversity is not where it should be still to this day. Um, what do you think is the next, the next challenge in education, the next 10, 15 years? What's our next challenge that we have to tackle? Well, my views might be divergent for a lot of educators. I've been out of it for a long time, and I really don't think about it too much, except I think about what my two great-grandsons and a great-granddaughter are going to be facing long after I'm gone. Mm -hmm. What does the future look like for them? Are they going to face the same issues that today's kids are going to face? Right. I hope not. 
but a lot of things are going to have to change. In teacher education, sometimes the teachers who work in urban centers, they don't live in the community. They live outside of it. They don't know their people. When I say know your people, in a real society, if you're of a different uh, ethnic background, you want to be with people like yourself. In my case, since I was always a loner, uh, I was able to walk in both worlds without any difficulty. I don't recall anybody calling me the N-word. Maybe it was the way I carried myself. My brother, on the other hand, uh, was called the N-word. And the kids who called him that, I'm talking about kids now, they mm -hmm. paid the price because he would go after them. He had an attitude that I didn't have. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes I admired him, and other times I would say, hmm, I shake my head. That is the way uh, I was brought up. I got to thank my parents, Carrie and John. A lot of people might remember them, some don't. But uh, they were the foundation for, for us. Very religious, also to the point that I rebelled. Because <laughs> We, on a week, there were Seventh-day Adventists, mm -hmm. and uh, as a kid, we would have to, uh, Friday night through Sunday night, all you could do was read the Bible, read the tracts, and so on. And at 10 or 12 years old, I used to say to myself, I'm reading the same thing all over again. <laughs> where, where is the difference? Yeah. And then I would challenge, uh, say, the minister who would say, you know, so forth and so on. And I remember, and I know I was irreverent too, but not in a nasty way. Mm -hmm. And the tenet of the Seventh-day Adventist is Christ is coming, and all those that are saved are going to go to heaven. And being irreverent, I remember, I was only 12, and I said to the minister who was teaching me, I said, so of the many people in this world, only the ones who believe in this are going to go? He said, yes. I said, oh, okay. That was part of it. I agreed. Mm -hmm. And then, he, and then I said to him, I knew I was going to get in trouble. I said, uh, have you, you keep talking about God. I said, is he a man or a woman? Well, what did I say that for? <laughs> he, read, he was white. And he said, you shouldn't say that. I said, uh, well, is he or isn't he? I said, the Bible doesn't say anything about it. He didn't know what to say. And then I said to myself, you know you're going to get in trouble because my, if my father finds out, I'm in trouble. And then uh, he did find out. So I had to be counseled by the church elders. <laughs> I, to this day, I'd never got a real answer. Yeah. But I had read, read the Bible from cover to cover on my own, as well as Shakespeare. I, went to the, I used to go to the Y and get, I love Western books. And why? Because it seems like the cowboy always won over evil, and I enjoy that. So today, for pleasure, I read a lot of Western books. When I finish, I give them to Salvation Army for somebody else to enjoy. A uh, um, hundred years from now, what, what, what do you want people to know when they talk about Bob a hundred years from now, Mr. Jones? What do you want that legacy to be? It's gone and forgotten. That's what, yeah. that's what they're going to think. Yeah. But what, what do you want the legacy to be? The, of, you know, when they think about you as an educator and as an administrator, as a superintendent, as a person. I don't know if I could give you an answer. He did the best he could. I always try to do things. My mantra is be simple and do it elegantly. In other words, if you put hard work in, it will look effortless. And that's what I tried to do. I think um, I think I think the, your mere presence when when I'm walking around the superintendent's office and seeing and, and seeing your picture, interviewing now, I had a chance to interview for the 40th reunion at Broughton High. I think um, I think I, I think the presence of seeing somebody who's successful, seeing someone that looks like you, it plays more of a part than than people could imagine. You know, I always remember. Um, you know, as a kid, you always told you could do anything you want, right? You can do anything you want, and you always believed that. But you always you, you got to see something, you know. So I, I think your presence, I think your legacy will be of of being an atmosphere changer. You know, there's there's a there's a game changer if you're into sports. You know, there's a game changer, and then there's an atmosphere changer. You know, they always say that you know, Michael Jordan atmosphere changer. You know, people who just change the scope of. Education. I think I think you're in that scope of atmosphere changer. 
that, right. that, I think that's what, for me, that, that's what your legacy, one of the biggest ones would be a change in the atmosphere of the school system. Well, I, I hope that that's uh, part of the legacy, especially for the city of Brockton. And I always used to say I loved the 37 years that I put in. Uh, I wanted to give back to the community because that's where I was raised. That's a city that needed help. Let me put it that way. It still needs help. Uh, the teachers are the foundation. If I'd had my way, a teacher, I don't know how much they make today, but when I see a superintendent, for example, of schools that has a really tough job making over a quarter of a million dollars a year, and then I see a teacher who might be making 100000 and I say to myself, to me, that teacher's worth at least 150 for what they have to go through. And you see today, because of COVID-19, the teacher ranks are being eroded. Why? Because of fear. Why is that fear? Why didn't we uh, immediately go into the schools, make sure the HVAC systems, make sure they were vaccinated, and in fact, I remember somebody said, what would you do now? I said, the first thing I would do if, when the vaccination comes out, I would vaccinate teachers, administrators, custodians, cafeteria workers before they go in the classroom. Now, it may sound a little harsh, but what are they faced with? Hundreds and thousands of kids that are coming out of, high out of households with grandparents and uncles and aunts. We know that that's a spreader. Uh, the science hasn't caught up with kids coming in the school. We need to eliminate the fear that a teacher has standing in front of 30 kids five times a day and get the disease and they have to bring it home. What do they have to protect themselves? A mask? Doctors have full protection. And what do the teachers have? And as a result, we're losing good teachers because of fear. So and when I hear a teacher writing out a will because they're not sure if they're going to get the COVID or not, I said, here we go again. The last people to think of are the teachers who are on the forefront. They're the ones that are preparing our kids for the future. And what are we doing? Firefighters, yes, they put their lives on the line. Policemen put their lives on the line, but the teachers are there every damn day. How do we treat them? So a hundred years from now, I hope they're making as much as a superintendent. All right. <laughs> That'd be awesome. And, and I agree. I'm, I'm going to fight for that one, too. It's rather <laughs> radical, but right. after 24 years of being out of it, I think at my age, at 89, I can say whatever I think yeah. is for good <laughs> reason, and I usually do. All right. Well, listen, it's been an absolute honor to talk to you, and uh, hopefully we can do this again real soon. Uh, just to, you know, just uh, your wealth of knowledge. So uh, I appreciate you, and I, I'm sure the city does. Well, I know the city does as well. I just, I just want to give a shout out to, um, to Mr. Wilson and, and, uh, and Mr. Trask for helping putting this together. Um, they really work, did some work behind the scenes, so I want to give them a special shout out. So that's it for the conversation. Um, listen to, to, to Mr. Jones, Superintendent uh, former Superintendent Bob Jones. Uh, it's quite an honor, and we'll do this again real soon. Well, thank you for having me. And again, I have to give Tim and Willie, they never gave up. They kept saying, we've got to do something, we've got to do something. And I said to myself, okay, when? But I always had faith that they would, and they did. And for that, I, <clears throat> for that, I have to thank them and thank you for having me. That's my pleasure. I appreciate it. My pleasure. We'll see you next time, guys. <laughs> <laughs>